I will stay on the ballot in all remaining states and continue to gather delegates. While Vice President Biden will be the nominee, we must continue working to assemble as many delegates as possible at the Democratic Convention, where we will be able to exert significant influence over the party platform and other functions. Um, I think most of you who are watching this program are committed to the issue of justice, economic justice and social justice and racial justice, environmental justice. Uh, I think most of you who are part of our movement, all of you who are part of our movement, understand that we live in a nation today which has massive levels of income and wealth inequality and tens of millions of our people are working at horrifically low wages. Uh, you're aware that we have a dysfunctional healthcare system and some 87 million Americans are uninsured or underinsured. So many of our people can't afford to go to a doctor. You are aware that we have a major housing crisis. That's not only a half a million people who are homeless, but all over this country, people are packed into homes, uh, apartments, uh, where uh, there's just not a whole lot of room. They're really uh, crowded. Uh, you are aware that many people living in cities where there are food deserts, where people cannot go out and get decent quality food, fresh produce. Uh, you are aware that today uh, millions of people have no option but that they have to go to work because if they don't go to work, they don't have a paycheck. And if they don't have a paycheck, they can't take care of their families. And you are more than aware that we have and are living in a nation where we have widespread systemic racism. Now, you all know that stuff, but what does that have to do with the terrible pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic that we are living through right this minute? Well, the answer is it has a whole lot to do with this pandemic, and it's a whole lot to do with who lives and who dies in this pandemic, who gets sick, who doesn't get sick, who gets treated, who doesn't get treated. And that's what we're going to be discussing tonight. And I'm just delighted that we have an excellent, excellent panel uh, with us uh, to discuss that issue. Uh, in a few minutes, we will be hearing from Dr. Victoria Dooley who is a physician, family physician in Detroit, Michigan. We're gonna be hearing from Brianna Joy Gray, who is an attorney uh, who has worked on my campaign for the last year. We're gonna hear from Dr. Barbara Ramsey, uh, who is a distinguished professor of African-American studies, gender and women's studies, and history at the University of Illinois in Chicago. We're gonna hear from Dr. Derek Hamilton, who's a professor of policy, economics, sociology, and African-American studies at Ohio State University. And also tonight, I want to thank uh, Shamir uh, and Indie Rock and Electric, Electro Pop Singer for being with us tonight and helping us in the transition, which will go from my remarks to our panel. Uh, so let me just briefly, before we get into the discussion, tell you how poverty, how income and wealth inequality, how a dysfunctional healthcare system, how a housing crisis, how people forced to work who have no paid and family leave, how all of this impacts the COVID-19 pandemic that we are experiencing. So this is how it impacts it. In Louisiana, 70% of the people in the state of Louisiana who have died from COVID-19 are African-Americans. But African-Americans make up only about one-third of the population of Louisiana. How does that happen? 70% dying African-Americans, but yet only a third of the population. In Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where unbelievably enough, there is an election today, that's a whole other story, Twice as many black residents have tested positive compared to white residents while comprising only 27% of the population. In Chicago, Illinois, 
African Americans make up more than half of all positive coronavirus cases in Chicago, make up 72% of the coronavirus-related deaths, and yet account for only 29% of the population. So how does it happen that in community after community, state after state, what we are seeing, we don't have a whole lot of statistics out yet, because a lot of the deaths and illnesses for the coronavirus are not racially discussed or described. But what we are seeing is the African-American community is suffering at a far, far higher rate than the white community. How does this happen? What does it mean? And that's what we're going to discuss uh, tonight. Uh, Dr. Dooley, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you, Senator. Uh, let me just start off by asking you what's going on in Detroit and why do you think the African-American community is being so hard hit uh, by this crisis? Well, um, here in Michigan, about 41% of coronavirus deaths are uh, among African-Americans from the data that we do have. And you um, gave some very shocking statistics about Louisiana and Chicago, about 70% of the deaths being African-American. And as shocking as these statistics are, they are actually pretty predictable if you look at the state of health and health disparities here in the United States. Um, the fact that African-Americans make up only about 13% of the population, but we are 40% of the homeless population. So of course, if you don't have a home to live, a shelter to be in for shelter in place, you're gonna be disproportionately affected. The fact that African-Americans are disproportionately incarcerated um, is a huge factor as why uh, it's spreading. And the state of jails and prisons in Detroit, um, as, as most jails and prisons across the country, very unsanitary conditions. Um, when you look at the workers who are essential but are underpaid, okay, so our, we know now that people who work at the grocery stores, people who work at the laundromat, they are essential employees. The pandemic taught us this. But African-American women specifically are more likely to make these low-wage, minimum-wage jobs, and they are not able to stay home and shelter in place. So they're going out and interacting with the public um, at work, so they're more exposed, more at risk. All right, I want you to stay on that one for a minute, okay? Could you? Yes. I think everybody viewing the program has heard stay at home, right? Yes. Stay in your room, go out for a walk in the backyard, but, you know, stay at home. Don't go to work. Yes. Well, that's good advice, but what happens if you're living on 12 bucks an hour and you have a couple of kids? You have to go to work, or you don't, ah. eat, or you, you don't have a place to live. So it's very tough when um, a, a lot of my Black female patients, they work in, like, um, they, they're caregivers. Um, they work in nursing homes, wow. um, and they're making low wages, and they are trying to support themselves and some kids and maybe even some help some family members out on the little income that, that they're earning. And so not only can they not stay at home, but they're in high risk professions because they're going and taking care of sick and elderly people, um, which is a very admirable job, but they are um, underpaid and underappreciated. And we don't have the proper protective equipment that we're supposed to have. We don't have the proper masks and gowns and gloves, except not at the hospital, but especially not at nursing homes. So and let me ask you this, and that is an enormously important issue that I think a lot of people have not thought about. Stay at home, work on your computer. Well, if you're working in a nursing home and if you're changing beds or if you're driving a bus or you're working on a train or maybe you're in a grocery store, you know what? You can't quite stay at home, can you? And not only do you have to go to work, many of those jobs bring you into contact with other people. And some of those people may be sick. And not only that, but in the African-American community, we have a higher incidence of obesity. We have the highest in prevalence of hypertension in the world. Why, we don't know. Some, we think it's some genetic predisposition, but I have to ask, what came first? A genetic predisposition, a high blood pressure, or the systemic and institutional racism that created high blood pressure in us? Hmm. So we're more likely to have high blood pressure. We're more likely to have obesity. We're more likely to have heart disease. African-American women, 50% of African-American women have some form of heart disease, whether it be related to high blood pressure or some other illness. So not only that, not only can we not stay at home, but we have more chronic health problems that put us at risk of dying for coronavirus. 
Now, I know the answer to this, but let me ask you a dumb buddy question. This may be somebody out there who doesn't know that. So what if I have diabetes? So what if I have high blood pressure? How does that impact uh, the likelihood that I will come down with the virus? And Absolutely. Die? So diabetes, heart disease, some of these health problems, they weaken your immune system. And not only that, but if you have diabetes and high blood pressure and you're overweight, oftentimes you have sleep apnea. Sleep apnea is a condition that can put a strain on your lungs. Um, my brother, and he doesn't mind me sharing, he, he beat coronavirus, but my brother, he was a principal in Detroit. Um, he had diabetes, he had high blood pressure, he had sleep apnea. So if anybody was going to get coronavirus in my family, I, I figured it might be my brother. Unfortunately, um, he made a full recovery. He did not need to be intubated, but he needed to be hospitalized. And he's home and he's 30 pounds lighter because he didn't eat for a week. So he says it was almost worth getting corona because of that. Uh, I so, don't think he means that. <laughs> he does. He was just joking. But yeah, he had not the best way to lose weight, I guess, not right? Not the best way to lose weight. But when you have those chronic health conditions, it weakens your immune system. And what we do know is when you have three or more chronic health conditions, you're more likely to die from COVID. And if you have high blood pressure and diabetes, you probably have sleep apnea or high cholesterol or something else or heart disease. Um, those illnesses go hand in hand. And the more chronic illnesses you have, the more likely you are to die from, from COVID. Okay, so you started off your remarks by saying these statistics were shocking, but not surprising. No, not, not surprising. They're predictable. They're predictable. Yes. yes, and that's why we need people like you, Senator, who are championing um, livable wages, uh, the minimum of $15 an hour. We need to eliminate homelessness. It needs to be eliminated. Um, we have several billionaires in this com com country who would write a check and eliminate homelessness. We need to do that. Everybody deserves a job if they want a job. We need a federal jobs guarantee. So in other words, all the issues that we have been talking about turns out directly related to this issue of who's living and dying. 101%. And we need to ban fracking, which you have called for, because fracking... Uh, that's another issue. We're going to get back to that one, too, yeah. because they're environmental. Yeah. I mean, it's an interesting study. I don't know if you saw that. It was based on one study, but it suggested that if you live in a community where there's a whole lot of air pollution, mm -hmm. interestingly enough, yes. you're more likely uh, to uh, come down with the uh, coronavirus. Absolutely, we need a Green New Deal. And a lot of people of color who don't live in fancy suburbs with lots of parks, it might not be safe in Detroit. It might not be safe for you to go out and walk. If there's abandoned buildings on every corner, I have a lot of the patients who were victims of rape in the city of Detroit. They were pulled in some abandoned home and raped. If you can't get out and exercise because you don't live in a safe neighborhood, then of course you're going to get deconditioned and your lungs aren't going to be as healthy and strong as somebody else. All right. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Stay there. Don't go away. We're going to get back to your art. Brianna Joy Gray is an attorney uh, who has written over the years many, many wonderful articles for various publications. Brianna, thanks so much for being with us. Of course. Uh, I know that you have been studying this issue. All right. And uh, why don't you pick up from where Dr. Dooley uh, left off? Why is it that the African-American community is being hit so hard uh, by this virus? I think the really crucial point to remember here is that so often, unfortunately, African-Americans are a canary in the coal mine. They are the communities which are first affected by a lot of the bad things that happen in this country. And there are the community that is among the worst affected when horrible things like coronavirus hit this country. And as Dr. Dooley so eloquently put it, or elo eloquently explained, it's largely because the conditions that cause these kinds of crises to grow are already existent in the Black American community to a greater degree. So when you're talking, you know, there was a mention of what's going on in Milwaukee. Well, Milwaukee County is 27% Black, but Milwaukee City is 40% Black. So we're looking at a city that's majority minority, where twice as many African Americans have coronavirus um, as compared to their wh white counterparts. And so you ask the question, why is that? Well, Dr. Dooley walked through a lot of the comorbidity, comorbidities, the diseases that African Americans tend to suffer from disproportionately that cause you to be more likely to die if you do contract um, COVID-19. But another factor is that on the early on, especially, 
one of the ways that you could actually be tested by COVID-19 was if you answered the question, hey, have you traveled abroad? And more likely than not, if you were from a lower income community, it's not so likely that you're going to have just returned from your trip in the Riviera or what have you. And so what doctors were, were, were seeing is that the patients that tended to get the test to even be able to find out if they had the virus and therefore needed to self-isolate tended to be more affluent, tended to be whiter. So you see those kinds of effects spiraling through on top of the points of care dis discrimination because we need more black doctors and nurses, um, on top of the fact right, that we are underinsured, et cetera. Then. Rihanna, say a word. This is something uh, I learned about maybe a year ago. And I had a bunch of students from uh, Howard University in the office. And they were saying to me, I hadn't realized this, didn't know it, that when African-Americans go to white doctors, sometimes their pain and their realities are not fully appreciated. All right, can you say a word on that or? Yeah, studies have shown that uh, white doctors and sometimes black doctors as well, because when you have these kind of systemic biases, we're not immune to having biases against members of our own communities, right? We'll judge the pain of black patients as lower and in fact prescribe them lower amounts of pain medication or not prescribe the medic pain medication at all as compared to white patients. And actually part of why you see the opioid crisis expanding first in the white community is partly because of the that, that effect, right? So what this perversely positive effect of the opioid crisis being delayed in the black community is because black patients simply weren't being prescribed opioids oh. even when they actually needed them. That's that's interesting, to say the least. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, so when you look particularly like at a place like Milwaukee and Wisconsin, what you're seeing there is a community that is has been particularly hard hit by economic factors over time as well. So we frequently hear politicians talking about working class, hardworking Americans, and they often exclude the fact that Black Americans uh, comprise a huge number of the working class jobs that were demolished by bad trade agreements in the industrial industrial Midwest. So that about 50% of African American men worked in those jobs through the 70s and 80s, and they were the ones that were hit so hard by trade agreements like NAFTA, et cetera. And so you see a population that was already disproportionately underemployed and unemployed. Now you see employment, unemployment rates skyrocketing as a result of coronavirus. The fact that Black Americans are disproportionately in low-wage jobs where we're forced to, or we're often the first to let go. You see a lot of these fast food restaurants, et cetera, being let go. Hey, so well, you start to, example. yeah. What about simple issue of healthcare? If I'm Black yeah. and poor, what kind of access do I have in Detroit or in Chicago or Milwaukee or anyplace else? To the quality health care that I need? Well, this again is related to this, this quality of job issue, right? So as Dr. Dooley pointed out, if you're working a minimum wage job, you're less likely to have paid sick leave. You're more likely to be working um, only part-time hours where you're not extended health care in the first instance. And the whole fiction that employer-based health care gives you any guarantee that you will be able to keep your doctor if you like them has really been exploded <laughs> by this crisis, right? Because yeah. now we see in just this past week or so, an additional uh, over 6 million Americans thrown off the employment rolls and now scrambling to figure out what to do, finding out firsthand if they didn't already know how expensive COBRA really is and realizing that they were might have to pay even more in terms of out-of-pocket expenses if they do contract corona in one of these first-line um, necessary jobs that so many of people in my own community are, are working. Okay. Uh, Brianna, thanks very much. Uh, Dr. Barbara Ramsey is a um, distinguished professor of African-American studies, gender and women's studies, and history at the University of Illinois at Chicago. Uh, Dr. Ramsey, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you. Uh, so let me throw out the same question as I did to our two previous panelists. Why is the African-American community being hit so hard by this coronavirus? Well, I think um, Brianna Gray uh, and, and Dr. Dooley have, have touched on some of the key points. I'm in Chicago. Um, and here in Chicago, of course, the numbers are pretty glaring that uh, while African-Americans are 30% of the population in the city, um, between 68 and 70% and of the deaths have been African-American. I think what it speaks to is that we really can't talk about 
of this pandemic in colorblind terms. Um, I'm glad we're having this conversation. I think it gives us an opportunity to talk very specifically about the coronavirus, but about the larger set of social issues that um, set the stage for the coronavirus, right? The, the intimate relationship between race and class in our society, in systems of injustice and inequality. Um, our, our dear sister um, uh, AOC was on Democracy Now! this morning, and she talked about very eloquently how you know, a precondition is poverty. A precondition is racism. So racism and poverty set the stage for what we uh, are now seeing unfold. The, the pre-existing uh, medical conditions, of course, the disproportionate numbers of, of Black folks that have diabetes and obesity and um, heart conditions and all that make us, make us more susceptible. But also housing, you know, also just having to go to work when you're sick. Um, and all of these things, you know, intimately bound up both racial issues and class issues um, at the same time. Other thing I wanted to just, you know, speak to on this question that, that, that hasn't been um, discussed thus far is kind of what Black communities are doing in response to the coronavirus uh, pandemic. And I think that's very important because sometimes in a situation like this, we feel like stuff is happening to us. But what is our agency? Uh, one of the things we can do is support progressive uh, political candidates uh, at the presidential level, of course, you know, uh, Senator Sanders, um, and then and then others in our communities as well. But there's, a, you know, the organization that came out of the Black Lives Matter movement is the Movement for Black Lives. And, and so they've developed a set of demands and it starts off and you will find this, you know, resonates with your campaign um, agenda, uh, Senator Sanders, put people first, which really indicts the ways in which corporations have still you know, gotten a sweet deal out of the response to this epidemic. Uh, communities are still suffering. People have not been put first. And the people who are most vulnerable in particular, which is uh, black and brown communities, uh, have not been put first. It shines a spotlight on the question of those who are incarcerated, in detention. We had a big demonstration here uh, in Chicago today that is a, uh, a demonstration for the moment, which is to say people in cars and standing six feet apart uh, circled the Cook County Jail to demand the release of people in jail, overwhelmingly black and brown people who cannot practice social distancing, who are being made very, very vulnerable. And these are, you know, people who haven't been convicted of something, right? People who are waiting, who, who can't post bond, people who are waiting for their, their hearings or who have technical uh, uh, parole violations and so forth. So all of this is in the mix when we look at the impact uh, on African American uh, communities. And I think in a real fundamental sense, you know, going back to the Katrina um, uh, disaster in New Orleans, going back to the 2008 uh, financial crisis, everything we are before uh, uh, the crisis as a society, as a community, as people, that's how we show up in the crisis. So we are a fundamentally unequal society. We are a society steeped in racism um, and white supremacy. And all of this manifests in the moment of a crisis. And the real question is, you know, kind of what do we do? Do we turn ourselves over to the people who say they know what's best for us uh, uh, and who may have, you know, and in fact, I think do have in many cases a different agenda? Or do we, we look at this as an opportunity to really rethink, right, what we're doing as a society, what our policies reflect? And that is exactly right. You know, I, I kind of think if there's any silver lining in this horrible, horrible disaster that we're going through, it is maybe the time to think about how we got to where we are. We're talking about absolutely, and where we want to go in the future. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, you think of even crises in our own lives, right? We have a crisis in our life, and we think, okay, I don't want to spend the rest of my life. What do I want to do with my life? We can do that as a society too. Good. This is hopefully a pivot. That's right. Okay, good. Thank you so much. We'll get back to you in a second. Uh, let me get to Dr. Derek uh, Hamilton. Uh, Dr. Hamilton is a professor of policy, economics, sociology, and African American studies at Ohio State University. Uh, Dr. Hamilton, thanks so much for being with us tonight. Thank you, Senator. Always happy to be on with you. <laughs> All right, let me throw out the question and take it uh, wherever you want it, where you want to take it. Um, same question. Why is it that the African American community is being hit so hard uh, by this coronavirus pandemic? 
Well, it is evident that it's not happenstance that the black community is hit harder than other communities. I mean, collectively, we made the moral and just decision to halt the economy in order to save lives. Nonetheless, black people a priori have low wealth, they have uh, inadequate health insurance coverage, and they have occupations that are more precarious. They, they work in jobs that are more precarious uh, with regards to work conditions, worker protections, uh, wages, and, and various other things that relate to a good job. They have extended family networks that they have to care for because of larger networks of poverty, as well as intergenerational aspects of, of, of transfers of both poverty and affluence. And then we have environmental degradation that hits certain communities worse than others. So we, we again, as I point out, it's not happenstance that if, if we have a community that is asked to stay at home, that one, they don't have the income to support themselves, nor do they have the flexibility of a job that would permit them to be at home. So, so that's not happenstance. Uh, now, the, the good news is that you, you pointed out silver linings. And actually, I shouldn't say good news. I should say that the COVID-19 pandemic is revealing our collective vulnerability in the sense that prime ministers, royalty, are literally uh, at risk for uh, dying mortality from COVID-19. But hidden in plain sight are the everyday vulnerabilities that various people have and live with because of their economic as well as physical conditions that they live in, in terms of, of uh, housing, environment, et cetera. So we can do something about this. That's the other point. The other point is that if inequality and despair, those are political choices. You have put forth an anti-racist economic bill of rights. And why do I say anti-racist? Because the bills that you're putting forth recognize that what we did in the past, going back to the New Deal, excluded certain people. And it was by design and implementation that those people were excluded. For example, excluding domestic and agricultural workers from labor bargaining, from uh, social security, that was a political choice. Likewise, today we can have a political choice with agendas that you put forth, such as Medicare for all, where we're not rationing healthcare based on one's ability to pay at, the, at their most vulnerable position. Right when they're sick, we shouldn't be worried about whether you can pay and ration out all right, let me, st let me stay on that one for a moment, Dr. Hamilton. What would Medicare for all mean uh, for the community, the American people in general, for the black community in particular, right now in the uh, coronavirus pandemic? What would that mean if everybody on healthcare as a right, if the function of our healthcare system was not to make money for the insurance companies and the drug companies, yeah. but to provide the best quality care for all of our people. How will that impact the black community right now? Yeah, and I'm gonna speak about Medicare for all, but let me also point out that the whole package that you put forth has similar elements to what it is I'm about to describe. We're not, we are saying that one, everyone will have access, period. And then everyone will have adequate quantity and adequate quality. So you're putting forth policies in my view that provide adequate quantity, quality, and access to something that's so essential for people to have agency in their lives, which is the ability to see a doctor when they're sick. So, so regardless of race, class, gender, et cetera, everybody would be covered under a plan. Let me, let me be, throw this out to you. Ready? Here's the question. You ready? Ready. Now, this must be an incredibly radical idea, right? <laughs> you probably thought of it last night the middle of the night, you said healthcare is a human right. You know what's radical? What is radical in, is believing that the market is the solution for all our problems, regardless of, of what it is. That's radical. To, rec to not recognize that the public sector has a great deal of power in the fiduciary. Oh, wait a minute. I have heard. <laughs> I have been told, my God, on the debate stage all over this country that people love their private health insurance. Oh my word, and isn't it great that you have a job and you got your private health insurance with that job? You think maybe just now in the midst of this terrible economic meltdown, some people might be rethinking what's going on now? 
in terms of people, you know, we're talking about people losing their jobs. Yeah. What else are they losing? Right. And, and what you pointed out is a conservative talking point because you're not telling people they wouldn't keep their doctors. No, no people don't love their health insurance company. They love their doctors. And, and so those are conservative talking points. But, you know, the other point that we should also make sure we mention is that in this package, you talking about a Green New Deal, a federal job guarantee, you're literally saying that the threat of unemployment should be removed, that the federal government has a responsibility to ensure that everybody has a job with adequate wages, adequate benefits. And what it also does is it allows us to build our public physical and human infrastructure. If we had a federal job guarantee in place or Green New Deal in place right now, we would have had more nimble workforces. We'd be able to redirect resources to where they're most needed. And we would even have the flexibility to provide for people to be able to work at home so that they can have social distancing. And then I'll say one last point. I, I know I talk a lot, but one, last point, <laughs> one, one last point is that our tax code should have the values of economic inclusion, civic engagement, and social equity. The most powerful fiscal tool that the government has, the tax code, should be one where we promote shared prosperity. So you are right we should tax wealth. You are right that we should have a, a more redistributive tax code. And one thing that's being set up as precedent from this COVID-19 pandemic is that the federal government can intervene to guarantee income. We're sending checks out right now. So when there isn't a national crisis, if somebody has inadequate income, we can put that in the tax code as well. Good. All right, let me get back to uh, Dr. Ransby. You talked about, you know, maybe it's a moment to do some rethinking. All right, pick up from Dr. Hamilton. What should we be rethinking? What kind of world should we be looking at so that not only are we better prepared for a terrible pandemic, but to create a better life for all of our people? Yeah. Well, that's always such a beautiful question because those of us who, you know, have been in the struggle for freedom on various fronts for, for so many years, I mean, we're often clear about what we're against because we feel besieged by so many things uh, and there's so many bad things to, to, to worry about that sometimes we don't indulge in, um, in thinking about what are we for? Like, what would it mean to have universal health care at this moment? You know, I think people, uh, people, are, people are also afraid of getting sick. I mean, afraid of getting sick, not just for their physical well-being, but afraid that they're going to get sacked with a medical bill, afraid that they, you know, will be forced to work anyway if they uh, uh, go to work and so forth. So, you know, when I think of what are the possibilities now, I'm just, you know, I'm pretty amazed certain crises um, get attention and, and seem to matter and galvanize public attention in ways that others don't. I mean, for many poor Black people, poor black people have been in crisis, right? There have been a lot of crises, a lot of precarity, you know, a lot of sort of living on the edge, living paycheck to paycheck, um, and also dealing with issues of racial profiling, dealing with the prison industrial complex. I mean, all of these besiege our lives in, in really important ways. So when we imagine... Let me jump in and, and ask you this. I want to pick up from... Dr. Yeah, I want to get to my freedom get, dreams, though. I want to get that to Dr. Dooley in a second, but are these, you know... Dr. Hamill was talking about the right to a job. Given yeah. the enormous amount of work to be done in this society, I'm not just talking about the infrastructure. I'm not even talking about climate change and transforming our energy system. We could be talking about childcare, putting people to work. In Detroit, Chicago, we don't have enough. And all over this country, we don't have the kind of teachers that we need. We have adjunct professors who are living on food stamps, et cetera, et cetera. Do. Talk for a moment. I don't want to get to Dr. Dooley. Uh, talk about the work that needs to be done in America today. Yeah, I mean, you know, the the you know what's often invoked when we talk about the Green New Deal. And I was glad I'm a historian, so I was very glad to hear Dr. Hamilton, you know, invoke the limitations of the of the New Deal of the 1930s um, around around issues of race. But one of the exciting uh, moments in the history of this country was imagining all kinds of work. I mean, people who were poets were paid to, to do creative work, right? Um, we can think of people doing childcare. We can think of people uh, um, making our parks more beautiful, people doing landscaping. We can think of 
you know, people renovating homes that, that many of our homeless brothers and sisters, you know, could live in. I mean, there's enormous work, public works, education. You know, I teach at a university and I've, for many, many years. And the hierarchy within the university of many of my um, junior colleagues, adjuncts, you know, temporary uh, uh, instructors live a very, very precarious existence. And they've spent many, many years, you know, uh, developing certain expertise in their fields. And it's really a shame. Our public school teachers, I love the Chicago Teachers Union uh, because they fight really hard for students and for working people. Um, but teachers are not paid what they deserve, and and we need more teachers. So, so I mean, all of these are areas. Here, if, I, if I can jump in, I mean, when jump we talk about a new America, and we learn something from this crisis, you know, I can't remember who it was, Brianna or was somebody earlier, about essential work. Wow, turns out the Wall Street stockbrokers are not necessarily essential, but the clerk in the grocery store, the person at the pharmacy, the bus driver turns out to be pretty essential. Teachers turn out to be pretty essential. Maybe this is a time to rethink about what's essential, what our priorities are, what is really important in our country. Sanitation workers, mail yeah. carriers. <laughs> That's right. That's right. All right, let me get um, to Dr. Dooley and throw out an easy question. I know that you've been fighting for this for years. What does Medicare for All mean for your patients? Medicare for All is going to be huge for my patients. Um, let me first address that some people will say, well, Medicare for All won't cure racism. They kind of like throw that out there as a reason not to fight for it. And to me, it's, it, it's such a silly thing to say. Um, freeing the slaves didn't cure racism, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't have done it, right? So before the doctor can discriminate against you, you have, to have the means to get to the doctor, okay? So let's work at step one. Let's make it so that everybody can get to the doctor, okay? And then what I'm so excited about your bill, because you wrote the damn bill, is that in your bill, you make it illegal for providers to discriminate against people because of race or gender, ethnicity, et cetera. And that, that's important. Um, all these racial biases that, that we learned uh, in medical school, we need to make medical schools accountable to train clinicians in providing culturally competent care. That is crucial. So no, Medicare for All won't eliminate racism, but it'll give you the, the entry to the doctor. And then if a doctor doesn't listen to you, you'll be able to go get a second opinion. I have patients who went to see, uh, went somewhere and they didn't feel like they were heard, listened to, but they already spent all their money on that one visit. They don't have any more money to get a second opinion. So with Medicare for All, eliminating these financial obstacles is going to be huge for people of color. Um, it's this really funny thing that insurance companies will grade doctors based on how good of control their people living with diabetes have, okay? So if the people living with diabetes who are my patients, their diabetes is under, under good control, they say I'm a bad doctor, right? But the, my patients living with diabetes, whose diabetes is not controlled, I know why it's not under control, because they cannot afford their insulin. So instead of insurance Let me interrupt you there. Let me interrupt you there, okay? Because, you know, I don't know. Last year I took a trip from uh, actually Detroit to Ontario. Yeah, yeah. Where we learned that the cost of insulin was one-tenth the price. There is a massive amount. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but unbelievable. Some of the viewers may not know this. A lot of people in America, I think this is what you're talking about, are rationing their insulin. Is that true? 101% sure. And what does that mean? If I have diabetes and I'm rationing my insulin, what does that do to my health? Uh, you could die at the end of the day. I've had many patients come in. There, there's a number where your diabetes is supposed to be under, under control. And that number is supposed to be in the single digits. And when they're rationing their insulin or they're not taking it, they come back and see me. It's in the double digits. Sometimes they can be hospitalized almost in a coma. And so the way to get people living with diabetes their diabetes under better control is to make their insulin free. But they want to say I'm a bad doctor because their diabetes is in, un, un, is in control, but it's not controlled because you as an insurance company won't pay for it. $250 a month for insulin with somebody who's making $10, $12 an hour. It's just not feasible. Medicare for all, free at the point of care will be life-changing for all of my patients, especially my African-American patients, and will help us 
to live longer. We're going to work on the racist part, on the implicit bias part. We're going to make sure that providers are held accountable, that they're going to believe Black women when they come in with pain complaints. We're going to make sure that that happens. But in order for those women to be believed, they have to have means in the way to get to the doctor. All right, let me just throw out one more question. I want to go to Brianna then. We don't have enough Black doctors and we don't have enough Black nurses, which takes us then to the cost of college, yes, and to yes. graduate school. Uh, not a whole lot of people can afford the cost of medical school. What yeah. would it mean if we made tuition, public colleges and universities tuition free, and we made sure that anybody in America who wanted to go to medical school mm -hmm. and who was prepared to practice in an underserved area, how would that impact your community? Well, something that a lot of people don't know is that Black Americans apply to, try to go to college and graduate grad school at higher rates than almost anybody else in this country. But the reason our graduation rates are lower than other groups is because we d don't matriculate often. And what's a primary reason why we don't end up graduating? Well, it's because of the cost of school. So this is a story that's very near and dear to my own heart because my own mother told me stories of how she went to Howard University, historically black college in Washington, D.C. My parents met there. And she ended up having to take an extra year to graduate from college because she didn't have $400 that she needed for her bill her junior year and had to sit the year out and work until she could come back, right? So having a free public colleges and universities and doing what you're doing is to say fully funding all HBCUs, whether private or public. So 76% approximately HBCUs are public universities already. Um, but everybody who wants to go to HBCU and everybody who wants to go to a public college should be able to go without increasing. We need more black doctors. We need more black nurses, et cetera. What would making, what would making public colleges and universities and HBCUs tuition free mean the black community in that sense. So an enormous amount of teaching jobs require you to have an advanced degree, to have a master's at least. So we're asking people to incur literally over $100,000 worth of debt in order to take a job on average that pays forty dollars or $50,000 a year. So people who do this is, are, are really heroes. They're people who obviously are deeply invested in the profession because it's basically a life sentence to go and get a graduate degree at this point in time, particularly for African. Americans because we tend not to have the family wealth to help us pay off our debt. So 12 years after graduation, the average African American has more student debt than they did the day they graduate. And say that again. Most people don't whoop, 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 whoop. <laughs> say that slowly and say it again. Yeah, 12 years after we graduate, we tend to have more debt. The average African American has more debt than they did upon their graduation. And part of that is because we're dealing with interest rates that are around 8%. I know that I'm paying 8% on my loan. So at this point, I've almost paid as much as it took for me to go to law school, right? But because I had something like $18,000 of interest the first year I was paying back my debt, it's very hard to keep up. And I'm one of the lucky ones. Play the world's smallest violin for me. I had a good job as an attorney, et cetera, et cetera. But so many people, especially teachers, aren't in that position. So your plan to make sure that teachers get at least a minimum $60,000 salary, that, they, that schools are funded so that teachers aren't having to reach into their own pocketbooks to play, pay for um, class materials. This is crucial to making sure that we have more equity, both in education and in healthcare. Okay, Dr. Hamilton, I want you to kind of maybe... Put it all together, dot the I's, cross the T's, what yeah. you got? And, and you know what? We need to think about millennials in this scenario as well. Millennials will have gone through at least two major economic crises. Right. They came into young adulthood right after the last Great Recession. And undoubtedly, the economic harm that COVID-19 is going to do is going to lead to uh, more precarious scenarios. But yet, we told millennials that their pathway towards success was through education. And we burdened them with record levels of debt. And also what's in there is the race element. So as was just pointed out, uh, black people four years after graduation have on average more than $50,000 in student debt. Compared I'll stop you, say it again slowly, because these are really, I, I think most viewers don't really appreciate uh, how bad the situation is. Say that fact again. Yeah, uh, four years after graduation, the average black debt is about four years for a college graduate. And, and let me also make the point that that's immoral. It's immoral that we have a lower rate of return to a college degree to a black person, as well as we saddle them with all this debt 
and we tell them that this is the pathway for eco economic racial equality. Now, I would say that irrespective of the functional role of education, it should be a right that we should guarantee in America because we're wealthy enough and we, we can afford to provide all our citizens, citizens and American people in general the, oppor the opportunity to have a college degree. That's the right thing to do. So, you know, right. I want to interrupt you. I want to get to Dr. Ramsey now because this is getting interesting. Uh, Dr. Hamilton talks about rights. Maybe is all right. Uh, what are we entitled to as human rights? <laughs> what are our human rights in your judgment? Well, certainly, you know, as, a, as an educator, I certainly think education is one. Of course, healthcare is one. Of course, housing is one. Uh, but I want to say one more thing about the, this discussion about education. I mean, I, I participated in a, a conference at UCLA recently um, by these wonderful young people who, who um, uh, are organizing to cancel the student debt, right? A, a debt strike they're talking about. So, so that I, I think is absolutely necessary. But we also need to really talk about democratizing education, democratizing education K through 12. Um, when my students come in, in, a, in, a, in a first year class, they've already had uh, unequal access to quality education, either overcrowded schools or schools not in their neighborhood or underfunded public schools, crowded classrooms. So all that has to be a piece of, of the puzzle of making higher education uh, a human right, right? So, so it's, 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 it's all, you know, on a continuum. The other thing I just want to say is, is just about how we think of the economy. And I'm not an economist, um, but I read a lot of economists. Um, and I think, you know, at this moment, we see the fault lines and the flaws of what many of us call racial capitalism. Um, you know, the fact that we have uh, hospitals and states and the federal government actually competing to buy ventilators and PPEs. You know, my, my husband works in a hospital in an ICU, actually, and uh, I'm very afraid for him because uh, the, the equipment is not there. But it's this sort of profit-driven system that makes us all vulnerable and is not providing what, you know, what some of us might think of as rights, you know, the right to health care, the right to protective uh, gear when we go into our workplace and try to serve others um, and all of that. So, so this whole question of race is really important, intimately, intimately bound up with the economic inequalities and the sort of logic of the current uh, uh, economic system that we've constructed, or, or I haven't constructed, but has been constructed and we live under, and we really need to imagine something uh, you know, a set of, of policies and practices that are real alternatives to that and not be afraid of it. Um, and that's the, that's one of the things I think that stands in our way of really imagining, um, making a claim for all the rights that people deserve from healthcare to education. Okay. Uh, I want to get to questions in a moment. Um, but before I do, anybody want to add uh, anything to this very lively and I think interesting discussion? Dr. Hamilton, I see you. We all have lots to say. <laughs> I want to be really brief, which would be surprising, but uh, th this is the one time I'm going to act like my brethren and be a traditional economist and say that with regards to racism, not only do we need to have uh, implicit bias training, but we need some teeth attached to it as well. So we need a federal government that prosecutes racism. So when a company is engaged in, in racist behavior or when individuals in certain structures are engaged in racist behavior. It's not enough to enlighten them to their behavior. Uh, we need to have sanctions and rewards for good behaviors so that we can have the type of society we want with regards to racial inclusion.